So my next job is to introduce, introduce the B.J. Kennedy Lectureship on Oncology. So I mentioned B.J. Kennedy earlier. Um, B.J. had his uh, medical degree at the University of Minnesota. He did some postgraduate training around the country, Boston, Toronto, New York. In 1952, he returned to the University of Minnesota. And I think B.J. was ahead of the curve. You, for people that have been here for a while, you knew that there was an entity called the Masonic Cancer Hospital. It subsequently got torn down and is now the new education building. But Dr. Kennedy really recognized that patients with cancer needed specialized care. He also engaged in Minnesota Masonic Charities to help fund that, which eventually Minnesota Masonic Charities opted to fund the entire cancer center. He, he pirated medical therapy for cancer. As he got older, he got more interested in geriatric oncology and how to improve quality of life for older patients with cancer. Um, and you may know, for those of you that go to ASCO, there's a B.J. Kennedy named lectureship uh, that is focused on geriatric oncology. So this is one of our name lectures. We have two name lectures. Usually we did them apart, but we're doing them together. And so I'm pleased to introduce uh, Laura Esserman as this year's B.J. Kennedy uh, lecturer. Uh, Dr. Esserman has many, many accomplishments. Uh, she is the currently uh, at University of California, San Francisco. She is the, the, the Laura Muir Endowed Chair in General Surgery, Professor of Surgery and Radiology at UCSF. Uh, she's a surgeon and a breast uh, cancer oncology specialist, and she leads their breast oncology, co-leads their breast oncology program at the UCSF Helen Diller Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, those of the medical oncologists in the room know that Dr. Esserman leads the iSpy trial, and I, I always thought that, well, that would be enough for one, any one person to do. Uh, but Dr. Esselman is interested in the entire lifespan of cancer, she, uh, breast cancer. She uh, has led the California-wide Athena Breast Health Network to guide 400,000 women through screening. Um, she's well-known, she's well-published, she's received many awards, including the President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology Working Group. Uh, she was named to that. Uh, the one award that I think is unique for Dr. Esselman is a couple of years ago, she was one of Time's 100 most influential people in the country. And if I remember right, Laura, your little blurb was written by Melissa Etheridge. So not many people get that kind of level of recognition. So it's really a pleasure for me to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Esman. She's going to talk about personalized screening clinical trials. Laura. <laughs> Sorry. Someone's technology works, apparently mine does. It's been so long since I've had to actually come in person to put something on a disk. My computer wouldn't allow me to transfer it. So I had, I'm so used to doing it on Zoom. I don't know why. But anyway, we finally worked it out. Did you get it? This will take a second. All right, that's good. Love that. No, no worries. There we go. Perfect. I'll use this as a reminder, everyone, please silence your cell phones for today's presentations. And following Dr. Esserman's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. So as you're listening, please think of some questions you can ask Dr. Esserman do a couple of things. Uh, about personalized screening clinical trials and her presentation. You're there. Okay. Wonders modern technology. This is me. And is, is there a pointer on this too? Uh, yeah, the top button. The top button is a pointer? Yeah, the laser. Yeah, okay, yeah. great. And this is just forward left. Okay. Not really. All right. <laughs> okay, so thanks so much. And Doug, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I really want to talk about really the concept underlying this whole talk is continuous improvement. And that not doing one thing and stopping, but to constantly think about how can we keep making it better and how can we accelerate knowledge turns. This is sort of the underlying theme of the whole Silicon Valley revolution was you know, Andy Grove, who was the founder and CEO of uh, Intel, 
said he never put a product on the market without having the next experiment and the next one after that, and the next one after that in the pipeline. And so things could seamlessly go forward. I am gonna, of course, I have to talk about iSpy because it's just like important anyway, but you'll see that that is sort of the prototype for how we should learn and how to improve efficiency. There, just because we've always done it in a certain way doesn't mean that's how we should do it. And one of the things he really talked about was that we really, in medicine, because we used long-term endpoints like survival, and we did one thing at a time, that we would never get to the point where we could accelerate knowledge turns in this way. So that's sort of an underlying idea. And you know, at the end of the day, you want your clinical care also to merge more seamlessly with trials so that we can constantly think about ways to improve. Um, these are disclosures. Um, and I actually uh, am on the board of Quantum Leap Healthcare Collaborative, which is the sponsor for iSpy and now uh, some of the other uh, trials. It's really trying to advance some of these new ways of doing things. Um, so I just want to start with saying one size fits all said no woman ever. Right, and, and actually it turns out that cancer is no different. And when I stop to think about how things were when I started practice, I'm old, and you know, in the 80s when I trained, actually I did, there were still people doing radical mastectomies. You know, if it was good enough for Halstead, it was good enough for me. That was like the mentality. And these were brutal operations. And even in the early 90s, um, you know, Women, everyone assumed breast cancer was one disease. Everyone pretty much got the same treatment. You know, it was mostly mastectomy. Anyone with a tumor that was a centimeter or higher got chemotherapy. Care was fragmented. And actually, women were very angry. They, had, they were not part of decision making. They were not given choices. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a really challenging time. And it was really about them that I really thought, you know, what I want to do is I was actually uh, did a lot of my research with Ron Levy in immunotherapy, uh, and it's taken me 30 years to get back to that. But it, it's, uh, you know, at the time I really thought, oh, as a surgeon, I could really work on trying to create a comprehensive center where everyone worked in, and, and together in one place where there would be one stop shopping for patients and that we would really bring women into the decision making process and help them be partners in their care and work on trying to improve and learn at every juncture. This idea of quality improvement being sort of the fundamental basis, you know, constant improvement. And when I think about it is sort of what really launched me onto the idea of these kinds of trials like I Spy. You know, I had also, along my training, long story, I got invited to be a Hartford Fellow at the Stanford Business School. And kind of learned that, well, medicine is a business just like any other business, but we needed to be in the quality and service business instead of the cost recovery business, but that still hasn't changed. Um, but it is, you know, realizing that you could change medicine for the better if you really thought about doing it this way and that we could move at a faster pace. And I think about the things that really influence me most, and it's just like all of us, I think we're all influenced by the people we take care of, their stories, their experiences, and their outcomes. So if I think about it, so one of the first people I took care of was a woman named Linnea. It was this amazing young woman who was 31 and um, was the first in her family to go to college. She was a sociology graduate student at Berkeley and um, amazing Scrabble player. She probably would have been the world champion of words with friends, but she, uh, uh, you know, she had a mother, Evelyn and a grandmother, Eartha, who loved her and friends that adored her. And she had all these dreams, of course, that didn't come to pass because she died of breast cancer before her 38th birthday. So this was before the cloning of BRCA1 and BRCA2. But the thing that struck me about her was she had this triple negative breast cancer. And it was very clear that we did not have the right drug at the right time for her. And it really made me think about trying to set up an infrastructure that would allow us to figure this out. 
right around the time that I started practice, I was approached by Nola Hilton, who was developing the sequences uh, for breast MR, what became breast MRI. She was a PhD in physics and said, how could you use this? And I said, well, let's look at people with locally advanced breast cancer and let's see if we can't figure out, you know, are these tumors all the same? And lo and behold, of course, they were not. And the responses weren't the same. And that really kind of launched this idea of trying to put the ice by two program together. And believe it or not, we've been working on this for 30 years. But the reason I want to go through this just briefly is because this set the stage for me for thinking about prevention as well. So what we thought about is, you know, that there are two things that really struck me. One is that while testing for safety in the stage four setting is a good idea, we've had decades of trying to change the outcomes in solid tumors in the, uh, in the stage four setting, and we haven't done it. And that may be too late. So what would happen if you just moved it forward? And then, as Andy Grove said, not use survival as your outcome and not do adjuvant therapy, because if you do adjuvant therapy, you take out the tumor, you take out the biomarker, you have absolutely no idea who's responding. That commits you to treating everybody the same, when in fact, we know these tumors are not the same. So the idea was, let's bring drug development at the stage two, three setting for women who are at high risk for breast cancer, highly proliferative tumors where we could say that complete response would be a good endpoint. And we spent you know, a decade trying to figure this out through us by one, and then launch this to say, okay, how can we use that even earlier endpoint, MR tumor volumes and PCR, and then set up a platform trial, to just crank through the drugs. There's no, there's no reason to keep doing a different trial every time you want to start something new. You want a platform and you leverage that infrastructure. So that's the idea, efficient, flexible, learning system, collaborative, and have it be an engine for discovery. Because for each one person to do it, it's, it's just not supportable. But if you have it as a platform that everyone has access to, it goes faster, many people can work, you've got this, and once it takes a while to build up, but once you've got that, then you can really drive and think about things. And I think that's been our experience on iSpy. And so we spent the first, as I said, you know, measuring outcomes by subtype and just learning, tr just trying to get everybody to choreograph their movements the same, right? So just everyone doing the same, you know, and not having everyone do their own biomarkers, but one person then making the results available for everybody. So you democratize the data and you think of a different way to give credit. Because in fact, the reason we have different protocols is so we can give everybody credit for the protocol. But if you say, okay, no credit for the protocol, you can be a chaperone or you could, you know, so everyone, you can be a mini PI and that's how you do credit. So that allows you to have that kind of efficiency. So um, we figured out that PCR was indeed a good endpoint if you stuck to the molecularly high risk disease and you could get better outcomes by subtype than you did all alone. And I spy two, which we are coming to the end of, I'll show you where we're, we're not going far, we're just going to 2.2. But the idea of that PCR predicts distant recurrence free survival with a hazard rate of 0.18, regardless of um, subtype, uh, and that residual cancer burden adds additional information. So the degree of response matters, and that your outcomes are better using molecular markers. And we've actually been able to come up with, re with a new response predictive subtypes uh, for that. And now what we wanna do, what we're going to do is what I wanted to do from the beginning, but wasn't able to do is to adapt therapy within patients, to be able to take all those cool you know, immuno um, conjugates, uh, drug conjugates and coming on the market, all these exciting markers and try and figure, can we, can they have a place? Can we do it first? Can we find those good responders and then stop if we get a great response and then keep moving on and give people the best of the therapy if they don't? So this has been the agent timeline since the exciting discovery that, uh, that, that uh, pembrolizumab triple the response, you know, almost all of the agents have had some kind of immunotherapy combination. And what are we talking about? We're talking about when you take a big tumor and it goes away, is that sufficient? And so this was the pembrolizumab. This is a patient from the pembrolizumab study. And here is Doug Gies, your fearless leader's paper, showing that 
and I spy that three that 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 you want to be on the blue line. These are the patients with complete response. And if you're not, then you're on the red line. And the whole idea is, you know, that that regardless of subtype, regardless of treatment, if you get a PCR, you're gonna do pretty well. You're, you convert someone to someone like a stage one uh, breast cancer. So with that, arm with that, and then with another paper showing that, you know, it doesn't help you to give more therapy once you've achieved a PCR, that we're on our way to really do personalized therapy. And I think one of the important things is that this result that Doug, that we published really was validated in Keynote 522, because here you see on the top, it really doesn't matter whether you got the experimental therapy or not. If you got a PCR, you have the same good result. So those people didn't need the extra toxicity. So we need to know who needs what, right? It's the people who didn't get a PCR who were improved. And it could be that we're shifting the curve and shifting the response. And the reason we're adapting is because all patients want personalized therapy. Can you imagine having a trial where you're actually looking in and say, oh, if you're not doing well here, I'm gonna move you to something else so that each patient is getting better care. I mean, our trials really should embody the way we hope care will be in the future. Um, and this allows us to decrease toxicity when it's appropriate. And it's this idea of an experiment and patient-centered development. So we need new trial strategies in the personalized era. And, you know, as I said, take advantage of these exciting things. And one of the very cool things that we, I don't think, I don't think the pointer works. Anyway, but the whole idea is that these are on the, on the on this left hand side, you can see these are the standard receptor subtypes. But if you even look at the hormone positive patients on the top, a third of them are actually basal and they have a big immune signal. And, and think about this because we're going to get to this as we start thinking about prevention In the triple negatives. There's a big chunk of them that have an immune subtype. But there's a chunk of them that don't. Some have DNA repair signal and some don't respond to anything. So why give the people who don't respond to immuno immuno-oncology agents the toxicity and the potential for adrenal insufficiency if it's not gonna work? And the same thing for the ER positive patients, we shouldn't stick to the old ideas just because. And the cool thing is that we started with a 19% overall PCR rate in 2010 with iSpy. And over the course of saying, okay, we can first try and add experimental arms, and that got us to a 35% overall PCR rate. And then if we thought about the optimal treatment receptor subtype, we could move that to 51%. And by then thinking about the response predictive subtypes, we're up to 58%. And so if we can start with that 60% and then get to this next point, then maybe you know it's our aspiration to get to 90% of patients with non-traditional chemotherapy in five years. Someone said to me, well, that's not very scientific, that's aspirational. I said, well, that's right. Because no aspiration, what, 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 you know, what, what someone said to me, you know, I said, I said, well, is that just delusions of grandeur? And they said, well, no delusions, no grandeur. So I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the delusions. So here's the idea, right? You have an experimental agent in block A, one of these novel reg regimens. If you get a complete response, you go to the OR and we measure, we predict that now with imaging, maybe we'll add in the circulating DNA. If you don't, you get rescued by the best subtype. I mean, by the best regimen from MySpy2, but we can also randomize within that to help people get over, oh, I have to give every triple negative patient, you know, an IO combination, but, you, but we don't, and we don't want to do that. And so we want to keep learning at each juncture of the trial and only then and when people get AC. But if we can really establish that AC is not doing much, we can replace that as well. So it's a framework that we can we can keep moving, and we can test our new our new um, response classifiers by just looking at block B and C. Um, so and maybe think about PARP inhibitors as primary treatment for mutation carriers. So we just have to think about it. So this platform has resulted in eighty thousand specimens. We have now. Um, to the, over 2,000 patients. We have 29 sites and growing, and it really tells you about the power of a long-standing platform trial. 
And this should really inform our approach to prevention. So if that's our vision, which is to make new and better, more personalized treatments available at a time when patients need them most, and if we really understand the mechanisms of that, and we start thinking about, well, who is at risk for what kind of cancer, we're not only gonna be set up for thinking about how to screen, but screening is just screening, it's not prevention. And what we need to do is really inject power into the idea of prevention and get ourselves on the path to start taking these lessons and figuring out where can we inject cancer interception? How do we understand that? How do we think about it? But just as with iSpy2, at the beginning, it seemed like a pipe dream, but in 10 years, it's come a long way. So this is, this is the path we're on for, um, for wisdom, right? So matching to patient's biology, trying to use early endpoints and continuous learning. So I wanna come back to Linnea. You know, today she might not have had to die. Maybe she would have been a mutation carrier. Maybe she would have had a complete response on iSpy. And that makes me somewhat hopeful. But I think about it, how did, we, we failed her in screening. She was at risk for a high risk triple negative disease. Do our current screening recommendations help someone like her? They do not. We do not have the right screening and prevention strategies for people like Linnea. And to me, that is unacceptable. So I think about the cell phones that I had in, when I was an intern. This brick phone is what I used. Today, no one would choose this. You know, when I talk about changing and improving screening, I, I, I like for many years have been, you know, persona non grata and pariah that I would dare say that what we're doing isn't good enough. But as any, I wanna see a show of hands. How many people think that we have the perfect screening regimen today? Oh, you are all so educated, I love this. But um, Dan Copans wrote an article on breast cancer research and treatment saying the wisdom study should be shut down. You know, the idea that, I'm, that, I'm out there, that we're out there killing women in their 40s. Um, you know, I, I, it's amazing how touchy people are about this as if like I said, oh, your baby is ugly. But it's not like, you know, I mean, everybody's baby is ugly at some point, you know, so you just, you know, it's okay. I mean, in this idea that why wouldn't you want to pre-screen? We are pre-screening people when we go into iSpy. You know, why, who, who in this room has TSA pre-check? Like, yeah, like all you other people get pre-check for God's sakes. It's like such a waste of time to wait at the airport. I mean, gives you, you can go a half an hour later. So this is a normal concept in our thinking. You know, we need to be thinking about who's at risk for what, right? So if you think about it, there are 42,370 women who died in the US alone last year. It is, breast cancer is a very serious disease. Okay, this happened despite screening, despite screening. And Doug just showed this morning that people die at different rates. African-American women have the highest risk of mortality for breast cancer. And it's not just because of triple negative disease, it looks like it may be, and we showed an ice spy that it's probably the people who don't respond to hormone positive disease have really bad outcomes. So, so there's something, something else that we don't know, but trials like ice spy help you figure it out. But they're dying at this rate, despite the way we screen today. So that's a problem. But the other problem is that there's another side to the story. There were almost 300,000 women diagnosed with breast cancer in 2021, very common, one in eight. And the other problem is that, you know, not everybody has a killer cancer. And this is another concept that is like seriously insulting to people, but it's, it's just true, right? If, and then we think about it, it's not hard for us to figure out in other diseases. Let's just take allergy. You know, someone has seasonal allergies, they might take a Zyrtec. You know, if you have asthma from ragweed, you might need an inhaler during pollen season. When does yours come? August? What? No, just say, <laughs> say, okay. But, <laughs> or if you're deathly allergic to bee stings, you know, then you need to have an EpiPen. And so what we need to know is who needs the EpiPen and who needs the Zyrtec? This is like a common thing. Every disease is this way. We shouldn't be surprised that cancer is this way, right? We don't tell women, go out and get a pair of size eight jeans, like everybody, you know, they wouldn't, you know, that, that would not work, right? 
So here's the story about screening, and this is what makes it not so good, right? So if you think about on the bottom axis is time, you know, this is the spread of disease, and you sort of think about periodic screening are these, you know, you know, dotted lines coming down. If you've got, and this is, I learned this because I was running a prevention clinic. I would see someone who had a normal exam and six months later had a seven centimeter tumor. You know, we used to instill, people say, oh my God, you didn't come in, you know, what are you doing? You know, it's your fault, you, you should have been more aware. Some of these cancers grow very fast. I mean, there are some people who, who are neglecting and not coming in, but bad biology is bad biology and screening is not gonna fix that person. Cat's out of the bag, even when it's probably two centimeters. So we have to think about that. There we need to think about better strategies for prevention, identifying who those people are. Who are the lineas? All of us know, you know, you know, a hundred lineas. You know, what if we could save half of them, a quarter of them, an eighth of them? I mean, that would be a huge advance. But there are the, those are the people indeed that unless we change or identify who they are, figure that out in their 30s. And, you know, most of those people have their risk in their 30s. And 40s and another big clue is all those cancers that i spy guess what fraction are found by screening or what fraction are not found by screening what fraction of the patient's tumors what what do people let me hear guess a third what who else and what do you think you're pretty close 85 percent not found by screening because they're bad, fast-growing cancers. It just this is this is just math, right? It's not anyone's. It's not philosophy or insulting anybody. And then you've got these cancers in the middle, like tumor C. It's slow grow. It's it's moderately growing. It's like cervical cancer. These are the ones where you're making the biggest difference. But there's another problem on the bottom here. What if you have a very indolent cancer? You can do harm. You can do harm because you don't recognize it and you overtreat it. And these are many cancers, some of which would never come to clinical attention if they weren't found. Now, a lot of people say, well, that can't possibly exist, but it does exist. And, uh, it, and, and it, it's, it's, there's an argument of whether it's 15% or 30%, but even so, it's a lot of people. You know? And so the point is to do more for the people that, that need screening and less for the people that do not. That's the promise of personalized medicine. And, you know, if you think about this, I, you know, there was, um, you know, we have actually shown this, you know, using a, a different threshold on the mammogram, the 70 gene test, you can identify these, you know, postmenopausal node negative women who have like a 98% survival, even in an era when they weren't treated. So we know that they exist. We, and, and there was a recent paper, um, from um, uh, you know, from from the Breast Cancer Surveillance Consortium, saying, "Oh, thank God, it's it's only one in seven. You know, <laughs> that's like seventy thousand women a year. So, I mean, these are people getting mastectomies, getting all kinds of things, radiation, things that aren't going to improve their outcome. We have to think about this, and it's not a bad thing. It's actually a good thing if we can actually figure it out. So, and." You know, one of the worst things that people have is like, I'm sorry, you have to come back in. And, you know, I just like last week, someone was calling me and she got called back in. She was like imagining, you know, metastatic disease flowing through her body. You know, th these are frightening and it scares people. And people get a couple of these false positives, they don't come back in. And it turns out that if you screen every year for 10 years, you have a 50% chance of being called back in. And the hope was, oh, if we can just do 3D tomography, um, that's going to really reduce the recall rates. I can tell you, we just finished looking through Optum data and the uptake of 3D mammography of TAMO went from 23% in 2016 to 83% in 2020. No change in the recall rates. In fact, there's a bunch of places where the recall rates are really high because of the screening laws and requiring ultrasound. So that's not solving the problem either. So we have to really think about who needs what and, and to try not to do that and to try and say, well, like, why can't we put all of these improvements to work? You know, there have been all these advances in cancer prevention, very poor uptake because we're not really identifying the people most at risk and nor do we have a way to tell people it works. Where's our cholesterol? Where's our blood pressure? You know, women don't wanna just take stuff. They wanna know it's working. 
So these are ideas for us to try and make it better. Advances in risk assessment. Increasingly, we're doing a better job of understanding who's at risk. We can identify the mutations. We can identify SNPs. These are, you know, Doug Easton as a group and the BCAS consortium have come up with all this. Why are we not using it? Why are we not putting it to the test? You know, the legal challenges. So now between the GINA Act and, and, and actually um, the Affordable Care Act says you can't be discriminated against because of uh, genetic information. So you actually, it's safe to actually screen people. These are the important things to move forward. And the advances in technology also influenced by the law. Mary had lost the, the Supreme Court case that said, and they were told they couldn't patent the genome and that opened the door for next gen sequencing. And although Mary had still, I mean, that is the high in the market somewhere in the 2005, two to 3,000 per, per test, you know, other companies like Color and Invitae, you can get a test for $200, cheaper than a mammogram today, because, you know, now with Tomo, we've increased the cost of mammograms. So we actually can think about using this up front, right? So today, both Veronica and Kim, who are age 41, would get the same screening recommendation, but it would depend who they asked. The internists would tell them to come in every other year starting at 50, and the radiologists would say, come in every year at 40. But it turns out that they're both wrong because Veronica's a BRCA1 carrier. She should be getting alternating MRI and mammograms and be screened every six months because her mother died at age 36. Whereas Kim has no genetic risk, low polygenic risk, no other risk factors. If she came in and started screening at 50, she would miss that 10 year period where she would have a 50% chance of coming in and getting a false positive because her overall lifetime risk is less than 5%. And certainly her risk in her 40s is like 0.1%, really low. So this is what I'm talking about. We need to make some of these changes. So this, what is the solution here? Do better, right? Make it better, give it an upgrade. So integrate risk assessment, screening, and prevention, and have a modern era trial. You know, all of our screening is based on the trials, you know, large from the, the trial in the 60s and 70s, from the HIP trial from New York, and from the Swedish screening trials done in the 80s, when guess what? We didn't even know there was an estrogen receptor for breast cancer. You know, so, and, and all of this argument, this heated debate is over that old data. It's unbelievable, actually. Uh, so, you know, and so, you know, we, in, in particular, we need to find the people like Linnea and make sure that we get to them sooner. Even what we're doing in wisdom to me isn't good enough. And so we'll show you how we're going to change that. But again, you have to start where you can. I didn't start I spy where I wanted to. I had to start where I could and get to where we wanted, right? So, um, and it really is, a, it's, a, it's team science at its best. So this is one of the reasons why we started the Athena Breast Health Network across the five UC campuses. And we decided what is the one thing we can't do by ourselves that we have to do together. We have to put a big network together. And so we wanted to start this women informed to screen depending on measures of risk. I love acronyms in case you missed that. Um, it's kind of like writing lyrics to a song. But anyway, so the wisdom study really is about trying to compare personalized breast screening to standard screening. And we had to start with women 40 to 75 without a history of breast cancer. And, um, you know, it's very patient centered. It's easy to, it's, everything is online. Uh, we have it in Spanish and English. Uh, it's all in plain language. And the idea here is that we ask women to be randomized. We ask them to say, we just don't know. And if they don't, aren't sure which they want to do, we ask them to be randomized. But if they feel really strongly, we still want them to join and they can choose. They can choose personalized or annual. And why? Because we also have bias in who's willing to be randomized. We don't even know what the differences are, so you have to study it, so why not make it open to everyone? And there are certain questions you can ask in the self-selection arm that you can't ask in the randomized arm, like if you had a choice, which would you choose? I was told when we started this that no one would ever do anything you know, different from personalized screening. I mean, I'm sorry, from annual screening and that everyone would want annual screening. But it turns out that 85% of women want the personalized arm. <laughs> so it's like, it's a good way to sort of 
debunk myths. Now, I wouldn't say that everyone is really compliant. A lot of people, I think, want the extra information and still want to come in. So we, you know, 30 years of public health messaging is hard to undo. So it's really important. And then it's interesting that pretty consistently since we started this in 2017, 61, about 60 to 65% of people choose to be randomized, which I think is actually pretty remarkable. I'm pretty surprised. That's what, sort of what we estimated from our pilot. And it's been consistent. So I, I mean, that actually surprises me. No, hi, just so what do we do in the personalized arm? We do mammogram with, with density. However, if you are at 40, we just assume the highest density because we don't want to get that first mammogram because the highest false positive rate is for people in their 40s. We have all questionnaire looking at the usual suspects of you know, family history, comorbidities, biopsy, age, race, ethnicity, the usual. And then we do genomic profiling. So we partnered with Color Genomics. And so we get, you know, first we started with um, 76 SNPs and now we're up to 313 and um, we're going to switch to low pass whole genome, uh, but we get uh, the nine, we, we decided to focus on the nine genes that are associated um, with breast cancer, elevated breast cancer risk, and we picked four buckets. Um, and we again had to make sure that the HEDIS guidelines were changed so that, you know, people wouldn't get uh, slammed for that. And anywhere from no screening until age 50 up to every other every six months with annual mammo and MMRI. So when to start, when to stop, how often to screen and with what modality. And if you are in the top two and a half percent of risk, you get called by a um, by uh, our, what we call our breast health specialists and um, you get counseling and I'll show you a little bit from our, our, our uh, tool that helps educate people about risk. Um, so one of the things that we made the trial, so we didn't want to pick something that would be outmoded. So we said, you have, you can, we, we're going to start and every six months we can upgrade the model. We're not testing a specific model. We're testing the concept of personalized screening. Um, one of the radiologists said to me, well, you can't do that. You can't just change the model you're using. I said, well, you know, if I'm taking care of someone um, with breast, you know, who's worried about the breast cancer risk and you know, they didn't have any family history one year and the next year they said, well, my twin sister got it. I didn't say, I wouldn't say, oh, well, I'm sorry. I saw you last year and uh, you said you didn't have it. So I can't take that into account this year. So, I mean, you don't want to design trials that aren't, you know, that aren't, don't have grounding in reality. Sometimes we get into the scientific things that, well, you can't change, but like life changes, right? So you need to be adaptive in the way you think about things. So we have actually changed these every six months based on, um, you know, based on what these uh, recommendations are. And, you know, again, I want to move on. I, I think, you know, I want to move on to something better. So, you know, what were we trying to ask? Is it just as safe? Is it just as good at avoiding high risk breast cancer? So that metric, we got funded by PCORI. We were the first, one of the first five pragmatic trials to be funded, but they wanted an answer in five years, which is pretty tough. So we had to say, okay, what, you know, I like the discipline of saying, well, what could we ask? Well, we could ask, is there an increase in the stage 2B cancers? You know, based on iSpy, I think the chance of that is like, of course, it's not, you know, those are the people that, you know, come out, they have the interval cancers. Um, but we're looking at stage 2A as well, um, and looking at, we're going to try and profile all the tumors so we can say, you know, what we want to find out, you know, who's getting what kind of cancer. Does it reduce biopsies and false positives? You know, will it encourage prevention in high risk women? Would it be more accepted by women? And overall, is this a better healthcare value strategy? So, you know, better outcomes at lower personal and even financial costs because that gives you more resources to do other things. So, this is the um, breast health decisions tool. So, um, we integrate the, the information so that people get here's their snapshot. And you can hover over any one of these things to get information about what it is. We, um, and at the end, so they go through it, we can give them a PDF summary. It can be sent to their primary care physician. I mean, one of the problems is getting the primary care physicians willing to, um, to cover uh, preventive interventions. People get uncomfortable things they don't know what to do. We actually, you know, have like, what is a polygenic risk score? I mean, this is something we've just added to be able to show you know, it's not a number. We don't want to give them a number because the numbers don't mean anything. You can have a polygenic risk score of 11. Next thing you know, someone's going to want a bilateral mastectomy. 
you know, that's, so you don't want to do that. And we don't have that kind of precision. So we try and show like you have an increased risk or you have a middle risk and, and try and encourage uh, screening. And that's why it's part of a trial. We try and put the risk in perspective uh, for how their risk is relative to someone else. The other thing that's very important is that we're trying to, um, we're trying to adapt based on ethnicity. So as, as you know, most of the trials that, uh, um, that the BCAC consortium looked at and uh, the studies included women of European ancestry, which really does not help us predict the risk in African-American women and people like Femi Alapate and others have really tried to come up finally with some set of SNPs that can work in African-American women, Alad Zev and, 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 and um, a number of, of, of folks have been working on trying to come up with the right SNPs for Asian women and for uh, women who are Latina. And so we actually have switched to using all of the you know, the, the, the different SNPs and different panels to be able to predict that. And if we can switch to low pass whole genome, what we'll be able to do is look at ancestry. Race is a construct, it's a social construct, but ancestry is really what you wanna look at. It's very interesting in the Caribbean, there's some interesting data that if you are in the Bahamas, um, that 20% of all cancers have an underlying mutation. If you're in Jamaica, it's about 1%. So I think, you know, the study of genetics is often the study of population migration. And it isn't really so much that you want to look at race, you want to look at ancestry and to be able to parse and tease these things out. And if you have low pass whole genome, you can actually do this by ancestry and apply the right SNPs that go with that and constantly keep um, working on that. And that's, this, that's a place where AI can be used in an ethical way. The trial is set to be able to allow people to participate online. Everything is rendered virtually, which actually is helpful in the pandemic. Actually, one of the things that the pandemic really helped is it helped people decide, do I really want to go in for my annual mammogram? So like all of a sudden we saw a shift of people being willing to take the wisdom study recommendations. Um, uh, you, know, you know, someone asked me like, why do you have to do it as a study? Why can't you just do it? And we thought about it, I mean, it's so logical, right? I obviously believe this is gonna work. I wouldn't have spent all this time. And I have to say, this is the hardest trial <laughs> that we've had. There's been so much resistance and it's so hard to figure out, you know, and going directly to women was also because the radiologists are very against it. So, you know, why, why not? And I, and I think about, you know, this is what Doug was talking about earlier is how do you get people to think about trials? You know, and the opportunities and trials, that's tomorrow's treatments today. Not every good idea works, so you have to put it to the test. I mean, it's possible that what I think that this isn't going to work. I could be wrong. And you got to be willing to put it to the test. I think about the Women's Health Initiative and how at the time Susan Love and I were getting trashed, but especially Susan, for saying that you know there could be danger from the use of combined hormone replacement therapy and christine healy you know decided to run this the women's health initiative and you know if you think about wyeth you know had this huge army of people out there saying how ridiculous it was and how terrible it was let's be clear Prempro was the biggest selling drug in the country and the women's health initiative came out definitively showing the 1.26 hazard rate for combined hormone replacement the sales of Prempro plummeted, and that is the only time in the last 30 years that we've seen a drop in the incidence of breast cancer. So again, that tells you that changing the hormonal milieu, you can do cancer interception in that way. So you have to do the work, you have to do the trials, right? And you know, if you, if you have something cool that you wanna do and it works for someone, you've helped that one person. If you do it in the setting of a trial, obviously it helps many people. You know, there are a number of states also that have laws. Um, and California, I think, was the first. Jackie Spear wrote the first bill, um, which we, there was a team of us that worked with her on it that said, if you want to participate in a trial that's not open at your university or your center or wherever you're getting your care, you can go to wherever that is, and that the standard of care costs have to be covered uh, and uh, for you to go there and participate. And um, Jackie Spear is actually introducing this bill. We, we, we actually wrote it four years ago, but it's being introduced now. 
and hopefully that will be national law. And I don't know if Minnesota is one of the states that has that uh, that law. I think you are, but it's an important thing to make sure that when you talk about it, the law does not help you unless you exercise it. You have to be. I mean, we get 20% of our patients from other, you know, from other um, who are not insured. But it isn't. You know, we have to send a copy of the bill, tell them it's illegal if they block it. You know, that you're going to go after them. And you know, all of a sudden, you know that, that. But that's what it takes. So you have to exercise it. So anyway, the studies are obviously important. And I like to say that you know we're not doing something. This is not a new idea. There are no really new ideas. You know, I have cardiology envy. You know that that you know in 1945, uh, the Framingham study started. They figured out systematically who had risk, what those early endpoints are, how you could drop those early endpoints: cholesterol, blood pressure, weight, exercise. And it used to be, you know, that your chance of dying of heart disease was so much higher if you were a woman. But now it's about it, your ch chance of dying of cancer is the same or higher. So what we want to do is we want to get on that same page and we want to believe that we can do it. And so we want to, of course, have a platform. So I, of course, have no intention of taking wisdom down, down at the end of this year when I finish accrual of the first study. I mean, I like kill, we have killed ourselves to put this platform up. There's like no way I'm going to let that go down. That would be like stopping I spy and doing something new, which of course we're never going to do. So until we've got to the right result. So we're trying to convert this to an engine for learning and improvement to say who's at risk for what type of cancer. We put in a program project to try and type all the cancers so we can start getting into this. And actually, the all of us data, you know, has some of these SNPs. Of course, no one's profiled the cancers, but there are six thousand cancers there. So. You know, so we want to really focus our resources on high risk and risk reduction, you know, and for those at risk to work to think about improving outcomes. So I'm going to show you an idea of what I have for a modifiable imaging markers of risk and to also try and use organoids to try and grow the tissue of people at risk, because it turns out it's easier to grow for people at high risk than it is for people with cancer and that that could be an in vivo platform for trying to figure out what are the pathways? How can we test new ideas and integrate learning? So how do you update that personalized stratification? And our idea is to start with DCIS as the gateway, as a way to say, okay, how can we try and see if we can make that work? Now, why is it that I think we need a test that measures mutations earlier? So it turns out that we have about 20,000 women who have completed the genetic testing, the personalized arm. We have almost 50,000 women in the trial now. Um, and the mutation rate is around two and a half percent. So we're clearly attracting a slightly higher risk population, but it's shocking actually, 67% of the carriers do not have a first degree family history, don't have a family history. So, you know, if, so it's either that they don't really have the risk or it's they come from, I mean, or that, that you know, that. And, and we'll learn, or maybe that should be modified by SNPs, which is probably not true because they did that study in Israel. But there's a lot of people with a lot of men in their family. There's a lot of people with small families. There's a lot of people who don't know anything about their family histories. So, but finding them in their forties is not that helpful. So the idea here is that you would go from now, which is like one size fits all. That's what we do now. Every person goes in. I mean, I don't know if anyone saw the Super Bowl commercial with Mary J. Blige going in and you know, saying, oh, it's okay. And she's like, oh, that's great. As if that's gonna fix things. And that just really frosted me. Anyway, um, I, you, you know, what we need to do is make it better. You know, if, she's at, if she was at risk earlier, or she's at a high risk and she has a mutation, we are not helping her by doing it that way. And so in the middle, wisdom 1.0, that's like wisdom. I mean, that's like I spy two. And on the right is like a 2.2. So the wisdom 2.0 is if, why not just do the screening when you're 30? It's a test that you do once. You get the SNPs, you get the mutations, and you take that group of people, you know, and you, you, you stratify your population. So you only bring those people back, you know, who, um, you know, to, to get screening at, who are that who are on that two and a half percent of people come in in their 30s and you could do something much better and you'd say well how can you afford to do that well two and a half percent of the population getting screened more frequently is nothing especially if you think about 
you know, dropping out 10 or 20 percent of people who are at very low risk. You know, we estimated that the cost, the aggregate cost of screening was about eight to ten billion dollars, with mammograms being one hundred and thirty five dollars. Now the average is three hundred and twenty six. We're running the micro simulation models to sort of look and see, but it's going to be easily twenty billion dollars for all that money. We should be doing better. We shouldn't just spend it because that means you're not spending it someplace else. So I think we can do that. Start it at 30 and then start figuring out now who's at risk for what what patient. I'm not going to go into this, but then we have we have this whole process where we have a stakeholder meeting, all the guideline makers, all of the payers, you know, all the employers, the employers who pay for healthcare to try and get them to do coverage with evidence development to help fuel this kind of a change. This may be my hardest challenge yet, but I expect it will be successful. So our, I, I want to just, so we're trying to build in our program project this idea of how can we use the, um, you know, how can we use radiomic, genomics, and germline genetics, as well as, you know, and do a better integrated model. All of these AI models and imaging don't help you determine who's got at risk for an aggressive cancer. Risk susceptibility can be incorporated into our framework and we can keep updating the model. We're going to close the randomized arm and we're going to start series of, of, of better, uh, uh, better models to try and test and start using early endpoints to figure out, you know, if we're catching, if we're doing a better job of classifying risk and, and until we figure out which next trial to run. And as I said, we're doing the organoid. So I'm going to take a minute just to um, uh, you know, it, it, just to think about you know, if we're starting to see indicators of breast cancer of subtype with high estrogen receptor polygenic risk scores, and um, uh, this is kind of the method. The idea is that you have risk assessment, risk reduction, culture change, and you have this precision screening. I'm just going to show you uh, really quickly this idea we have for DCIS. So I. Another acronym, of course, RECAST. So, reevaluating conditions for active surveillance as treatment. This is our pilot adaptive trial for DCIS. So, the goal will eventually be to get to an iSpy like trial for prevention. So, if we think about, you know, about 3% of DCIS patients opt out of surgical standard care, I've been running an active surveillance uh, trial for about uh, 15 years, a little more than that. And what we found, and we've been trying to do the serial imaging to try and, that's what we started because I didn't know what we were going to find, putting people with ER positive disease on hormone therapy. And, you know, one of the things we've learned is the DCIS biology reflects the cancer that's going to develop. So it's an opportunity for prevention. And if you think about it, what would those right biomarkers be that would be, you know, hypertension, cholesterol of breast cancer? Well, it turns out that probably background parenchymal enhancement on an MR is probably one of those great things that's easy to measure and it's very estrogen responsive and it goes away. It's better than breast density, which is hard to measure. So I'll give you an example. So this is your classic presentation of DCIS. Someone, this is a physician who came in, she's 50, premenopausal, has five centimeters of calcifications right in the middle of the breast, make it really hard to do anything but a mastectomy. She was told that she probably should have a bilateral mastectomy because she had you know, calcifications on both sides. And, um, you know, so when I looked at her first MR, this is what she had, extensive background enhancement, all that white stuff. But you can't find a focal lesion here. So I said, look, just don't rush to the OR. Your life is not in danger. Wait three months, let's repeat it and see what you've got. Completely gone. And this probably is what happens to 60% of patients. So but there's probably 60% of people with DCIS that don't need surgery. There are people with focal lesions and they do need to go on. And this is sort of what we've learned. This is our swimmer's plot of trying to figure out who had what. And about half the people who went to the OR wound up having invasive cancer. But we can figure out now who needs it and who didn't. We, had, we, we saw that some people didn't have a focal lesion at all. Focal lesions could be a mass or a non-mass enhancement. The ones with mass, more risk. That background enhancement is very variable and you could have a response to either one. And what happened is we used, we went back to all of our studies and tried to say, well, what are the features using our part, which is a recursive partitioning, let it tell us what things really mattered. And it turned out that the three questions are, is there a distinct lesion? 
that's a mass that puts you at high risk for developing a cancer over the next two years or so. If you if it's non mass enhancement, is there evidence of endocrine responsiveness? And if you don't have background that's responsive, you know, if if the non mass enhancement is distinct from background from the background, those people are at high risk. But if you are responsive, for the most part, you're going to do well unless your background goes away and it reveals an underlying lesion. And of course, if you think about it, that's kind of telling you that you know either both the background tissue and the lesion are responsive. That's probably a good candidate, you know, or that the lesion is sensitive and um, and and but the background isn't. That might be that's a moderate change. But if the tissue background is reduced and the lesion isn't, that's an opportunity to understand why is that resistant? Those probably in our, our luminal B cancers. So we can start to figure that out with the organoids. You know, and if neither the lesion are not, nothing's responsive, that's also another question we can ask. But so this is our approach to trying to figure this out. So I think this is, and so we're actually, as we have, we partnered with Sanofi with our oral CERD, um, in the endocrine optimization pilot, they're going to give us the CERD for that. So we're going to do a two to one randomization of tamoxifen versus an, uh, the CERD and see if we can replicate this, standardize in a semi quantitative way, quantitative way while we develop the quantitative imaging tools like we have in iSpy. Um, and you know, certainly we give six months of hormone therapy to someone who's got a stage three hormone positive cancer. You could surely do it for someone with DCIS. And anyway, this is our protocol. And um, there's an interesting paper that just came out from someone in our group in San Diego who showed that the underlying SNPs might also be one of the big predictors of who's going to go on to get a cancer. So that's something we're going to incorporate. Anyway, I'm going to skip that. And we're uh, fortunately, most of the people who are going to participate in this are already part of the ISPY network. So we've got all the imaging stuff worked out. So I think it gives us a chance to be a leader in thinking about that, but also a leader in trying to think about how we're going to change this. I mean, doing the same thing, you know, we have been taking 60 to 70,000 DCIS out of the population for two decades, and we have dropped the invasive breast cancer rate. You got to say something is wrong here. That's not what happened to colon cancer. And you guys said we, we don't have the right precursor, but we could start to learn this. There are lots of things we can do. The people have immune infiltrates, things that we can do, like we can learn about this. So just to say this, just like in iSpy, the whole wisdom study is just this huge network of people that with this team science at its best. And um, that's what it takes to make this kind of a change. Um, so if you know the study is open nationwide, if you know anyone between 40 and 75, if you yourself are between 40 and 75 and are a woman and have not had breast cancer, you can do this on your phone right now during the next speaker's talk. Um, you know, I, I would say that our message is to be one of the 100,000. And I think this is, I wanna come back to Doug's comment about equity, that if you don't have participation, you don't have representation. And we want, we have an R01 to try and increase the diversity in the population. And I'll tell you, it is very hard work and there's a lot of suspicion, but it is everyone's job to make sure that we do a better job and how we organize our trials. And one of the things I've realized, if you don't have your trials open and the sites where there are higher minority populations and your leaders of the trial don't look like the people you want to recruit, you're not going to do a very good job. And that is something that all of us have to double down and think about. And so we have to say that everyone, we want everyone to participate so their data is represented so we know that the results will um, apply to them. So just in closing, would say that, you know, just because these 42,000 women died of breast cancer last year doesn't mean that that has to happen this year or next year or the year after. And uh, so we're on a mission to celebrate more birthdays. So thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause for Dr. Esserman. My name is Max Huber. I'm the Senior Communications and Marketing Manager here at the Masonic Cancer Center, and I will be your MC for the next two days. 
Uh, before we start our Q&A session, uh, I do want to remind everyone, breakfast is available right over here. They're going to take that away, prepare for lunch. So if you do need to grab anything, head over there now. Um, but we're going to walk around with a microphone. You're going to see Hannah. She is somewhere. So if anybody does have a question, I'll be monitoring. She's right here. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand. And if you do have a question, please hold the microphone up close to your mouth. Don't because we are also on Zoom, so we want everyone to be able to hear that. So I know that there are a lot of questions from the crowd. Who has our first one? Don't everybody jump at Don't once. Don't be shy. OK. Oh, we got one back there. All right, Dr. Nelson, who I'm also, uh, we are flag football coaches for five-year-olds. So we had a really fun day yesterday herding cats. Not my main specialty. Um, so thank you very much, and sorry, I'll try and thanks for getting the volume down on that. Um, so Andy Nelson, I'm a molecular pathologist and really interested in the wisdom study from the standpoint of as you sequence these nine genes, which we know are highly associated with breast cancer risk, what are you doing with the patients who end up with variants of uncertain significance? Because, you know, it, seeing how we could get those patients randomized across those different screening buckets seems extraordinarily important to me. Um, so that's a really good question. Um, we are not divulging that information. And uh, Mary Claire King uh, is very clear. We, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about this. I think that is where you could do serious harm. And she felt absolutely certain that we have no business telling people. We obviously keep a database of all these people and should anything we tell people, there could be minor changes. And if something changes, we'll let you know. Um, so we have this database. And you know, it's everything is up in the VAR, right? So it's, but I mean, would you agree with that? That that absolutely. I mean, obviously, Mary Claire King is the key leader here. But I, I mean, that's the same same perspective we've had in some of our smaller precision medicine trials here too, which is variants of uncertain significance in the risk perspective. We should right. just keep track of those, but we don't want that, particularly in a thirty year old woman. Right. out it's, there trying to drive what she thinks about it. It's a, it's a very different thing when you give a variant of uncertain significance diagnosis to a patient who has breast cancer and, and you can counsel the patient based on, you know, does this or does this not explain part of why you got that cancer. But for someone who has right. nothing yet, it just creates Especially tremendous Especially in a population level, I think there's huge opportunity for harm. I mean, there are a lot of people who I take care of who are shocked to find out they have mutation. And then what do you do? The next thing that we're going to be able to do, we're working with Bodicea model also to take the SNPs. So the SNPs actually, I, I think that's really important because you can take someone who's like a BRCA1 carrier or a PALB2 carrier and you can add in the SNPs and your risk can go down to like 35, 40% versus 70 or 80%. And if you're BRCA2, that's pretty huge because then you drop that in half with an endocrine therapy, you're down at 20%, that's not so high and you wouldn't, there's, you have no business doing a prophylactic mastectomy for that. So we're working on the sequences to, I mean, the, the software to be able to do that routinely, because I think that's actually really important too. Very cool, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Nelson. Who else has a question? Hannah has the mic we right there, Dr. Largaspada. So perhaps you're asked this a lot, but for the iSpy trials, it looks like it involved multiple pharmaceutical companies. So how did you get them all to agree to participate in this one entity? charm no i'm just i was like i could tell so doug and i doug and i are the it you know it's, it's doug actually he's the chair of the agents committee with me it's charm. <laughs> it's definitely charm so you know it's very interesting when we started this you know this is like I, I i perhaps really you know when someone says well you can't do that no one does that that that's usually an invitation to me to like say okay well like okay now we're yeah. gonna do it so but you know, it, the point was people said at the beginning, oh, well, no one will put their drugs in the same trial, you can't do that. So we did have a couple of things. We wouldn't do head-to-head -head comparisons of, of, the same, uh, of the same mechanism, although we're sort of violating that now, don't you think? Yeah. But you know, we slipped that in around year nine, so nobody really noticed. Anyway, so, uh, but I, I think the thing is that it's actually much more efficient for companies, they can't they can't do what we can do, actually. And it's, you know, so many of the trials now are run by pharma and we it doesn't allow us to answer the questions. 
and they they do see you know the trick was trying to get people to think about something that wouldn't just be a science experiment because they weren't interested and at the beginning you know the companies are really not interested in finding out who wouldn't be appropriate for their drug you know that was actually a, i think a pretty hard sell right doug and you know we had to work hard to try and explain to them why we thought that this would work and you know just relentless we were just relentless about it and you know i think it's we just needed we didn't need everyone to buy in we needed two or three people to buy in and we had this series of retreats out of napa valley in a nice place one, one of my friends benefactors was like owned one of the beautiful wineries there and we were in this beautiful glass room you know where we are all there with anna barker who was the deputy director of the nci and janet woodcock I, I, let, let's yeah, janet woodcock and anna barker probably without them we wouldn't have ice by and uh they were all there saying that they wanted to see this happen and who in the audience we 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 picked key people that we thought would be likely to do it and like who was going to step up and I think it was David Chang who was at the time at Amgen said, you know, I don't really care if, if, if Merck's IGFR inhibitor is ahead of mine and it works for them, I know I'm gonna develop my drug. So that actually works for me and I wanna participate. I think that was, that was like the key thing at the meeting that made the difference in that you just need one or two people to participate. Rich Shilsky said to us at the beginning, he said, well, you know, you better have a winner in your first ones or you're dead and first two were winners we were like we, we were lucky so that's good better lucky than good though that's what norm chen always said <laughs> all right i think we have to keep dr esserman on her schedule because you have okay. another thing at 10 30 so we're going to send okay. you off to that pretty quick but hey round of applause one more time for dr esserman <laughs>